give everyone another minute or so to settle down and get back to their seats. Uh, I just want you all to know the reason I'm wearing masks today, we just left, is we were actually exposed to COVID on Tuesday. Dan Sorrells, who we were sitting in the boardroom with all morning um, on these slides, uh, he tested positive yesterday. So I feel fine. I tested negative. Ian tested negative. He has a headache. He thinks he's going to leave, so he just left. But I will be keeping a mask on. I noticed all day I've been wearing a mask, so to keep you all safe. That's why I said no one in the front row, because I am going to have my mask off to talk. But um, I also won't be staying at the end to have beers and rub elbows with you, because I do want to keep you all safe. So I'm going to test on Saturday. Uh, and see if it's still negative. I'll go to the party. Obviously, if not, I, you won't see me at the party this Sunday. I didn't see Dan, so I'm saying. Yeah, Marcel was, he was on a plane. Um, or no, you were in Panama Canal on Tuesday, weren't you? Um, so, at, at any rate, I think we'll get started. So, you know, I think all of you know me. You don't know me very well. My name is Judy. I'm Executive Vice President of Corporate Office and Asset Management. I have been working here uh, with Marcel at RCS, formerly Colorado and Santa Fe, for those of you who have been here that long, for more than 33 years. And many would say a life sentence of sorts. <laughs> One of Marcel's greatest strengths over the last few decades has been his ability to foresee the big picture macro uh, trends in both the economy and the real estate industry. And that's allowed RCS to take advantage of many market-timed opportunities over the decades. As you will see in the slides to come, we believe that we're on the cusp of just one such opportunity right now. 2022 was a transition year from the post-COVID, if we can call it that, good times, to a, a seat of cautionary foreboding in the spring and summer and fall as interest rates started to rise precipitously and uh, inflation remained stubbornly high. The good news is that since last April, RCS has been preparing um, for this and for the coming downturn, which we do still predict will be in full force by the end of the year or early next year at the latest. <coughs> We've been building up cash reserves. We've been locking in debt uh, uh, through swaps. So our interest rates are locked. Uh, and we've been becoming ever more selective on our buying opportunities, as you'll hear from Adam. Indeed, we've actually been worried since 2019, as you may have heard from previous meetings, about some overheating in the market. And we've been taking advantage of that seller's market over the last few years to harvest and reap profits on some of our existing deals, uh, many of our existing deals, actually, over the last few years, as you'll also see um, uh, later on. And we've been transferring them, 1031 exchanging them, to the safe harbor of single tenant net lease assets. So we now have a pretty diversified and safe and stable portfolio. The buying opportunities in 2023 are going to be early rock, and Adam will talk about that a little bit in, in, this, in this presentation. And that is due to what I just mentioned, the high interest rates, the lender withdrawal of liquidity in the marketplace. And there's uh, right now just a very big gap between what buyers are willing to pay and what sellers are willing to take. So we think it's going to be a somewhat lean year in 2023. And as a result, you know, I, I would ask all of you to, to use this time productively to sort of hunker down and, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Hunker down and work on our processes and procedures. Um, you know, iron out the kinks in our, in our, in our communication and our workflow. And, and set ourselves up for you know, what we believe is going to be a very busy, uh, but also very lucrative 2024 to 2026. You know, the kinds of opportunities that, that we're going to be seeing here in the next few years, it's, it's been RCS's bread and butter over the last few decades. But it, it's, it's going to take all of us working together um, efficiently and cooperatively in order to, to reap the benefits of these opportunities. So I, I would also encourage each and every one of you to speak up with any thoughts you have about improving RCS, any process, procedure, you know, no idea is too small. I, I really would encourage all of you to speak up, both to your managers and, and to me directly. My door is all, always open and no idea is too small. So please speak up your, your ideas and thoughts are valid. And, 
what we're going to do now is the fun part of this. Uh, what we're doing this, uh, for those of you who have been in previous meetings, we usually do these service awards at the end, but we thought we'd, we'd do it up front. Keep, keep you interested a little longer. So the service awards, and by the way, that is an awesome picture. I think all, just about all of you were here, but um, that's our company picture we took last fall, and I think it turned out great. So we're going to talk about promotions here real quick. Uh, I won't ask, I won't bother with any of you standing up, but we'll, we'll call out your names. So Adam Aylin was promoted to Chief Acquisitions Officer. Congrats. Uh, Philippe Brady, Senior Acquisitions and Al Analyst. Meryl Davenport, Senior Asset Manager. Aaron Ingram, Director of Business Systems. Ilya Koslov, Senior Acquisitions Associate. Brian Mastician, VP of Asset Management. Owen Orr, Senior Acquisition Analyst. Jessica Pressler, Senior Asset Manager, Shay Stryker, Senior Acquisitions Associate, and Ian Webb, uh, who just left, <laughs> Executive Vice President of Finance. Do you all hear me okay? I, I noticed that my, okay. So the milestones that we celebrate are the following. No one's gotten to that 35 or 40 years yet, but if I'm still alive in two years, you'll see me up here. <laughs> <laughs> So three years ago, we were all healthy. We had barely even heard of COVID. It didn't really exist. Well, it kind of existed, but not in our world. 401k accounts were booming, and one employee began her career at RCS. And that is Jessica Bessler. Going to be just handing out your award, so if you just sort of stand up and meet her, she'll walk down to meet her to greet you. Five years ago, Southwest Airlines flew a plane full of puppies to safety after Hurricane Harvey. Uh, the RCS Investment Committees and Strategic Operation Committees had just emerged at RCS, and three employees joined the company. And that is Diana Hill. And Allie Reed. And Brian Mastician. <laughs> Ten years ago, Barack Obama was re elected president. Canada stopped the production of the penny. Retail price of a gallon of gas was $3.91. Too bad. Movie ticket, $8.20. And a dozen eggs, that sounds pretty good. $1.54. <laughs> That's a lot better than now. And Beth, by the way, later on during the QA, is going to be handing out $5 bills to people who ask questions. But there's a five dollar bill right now for anyone who can tell me what is wrong with this picture. No, you know. All right. No, no, no. So who can tell me? Oh, Robert, what? What's wrong? That's not a Canadian. You got it. You got it. Yes. Nice work. Here you go. I, by the way, by the way, did not make this slide. I noticed the mistake. And my, my, my daughter is like, well, my, my daughter is a Canadian resident, that's why I guess it. Oh, and the one thing we missed about this, you see Marcel up there, that little handsome face? He turns 65. <laughs> yeah, 10 years ago. <laughs> and Four people joined RCS, and that is uh, Dan Semler, yep. Ian Webb, who I'll have to get his award later, Dave Story. By the way, he was with us for a while longer in the company called Facility Logic. He was the spin off of, of the maintenance portion. They were a separate company, and he worked for them for many years uh, before joining RCS 10 years ago. And Deborah Hopkins is that one. <laughs> 15 years ago, Steve Jobs was probably the most famous person in America. The most popular web browsers were the Internet Explorer and Firefox. 
and RCS was still called on the Santa Fe Real Estate. And one employee joined the company, and that is Caitlin Hall. Twenty years ago, American Idol premiered on Fox. Unemployment hovered around 5.8%. Not bad, but it's a lot better now. Inflation averaged 1.5-8%, which is a lot better than now. Um, federal minimum wage was 6.75. Apple released its second gen generation iPod with 20 gigabytes of storage. Can you imagine that? And 10 of our current employees were 10 years old or less. And one current employee was only three years old. <laughs> and one person joined the company, which was still Colorado Santa Fe at the time, and that is Jason. <laughs> and now I am going to turn the mic over to Marcel, who is going to talk a little bit about the macro strategy. Thank you, Drew. Uh, that was a great summary. You should probably give my talk too. Uh, well, I'm going to start um, with a little bit of an overview. Um, we've been around for 39 years. Uh, it'll be 40 in September. Uh, and we're, as many of you know, we're um, quite considered to be quite successful by just about any, uh, any, any way you try to look at it. And so the question is, why are we uh, successful? Well, as the top part of the slide says, it has to do with capital and talent. And um, if you look at the talent and you look at the team characteristics, I always hear the word smart when I hear about people at RCS. Uh, and the fact is, the between the capital and the talent, uh, the talent is far more important than any, form of any business person to tell you that. In fact, I have a, if you look at SMART, I have a, an observation that uh, money money isn't SMART, it's actually stupid, it just sits there. And so people manage money. So capital is important if you don't have it, but if you have it, uh, it's the people that make it work. Um, I've heard people tell me, uh, I'm in touch with a number of people, that we're doing business with Joe Bauer. I had a meeting with him, uh, Ryan Atkin uh, has been out there, uh, and uh, Taylor, and a whole bunch of other people. And they report very glowing things back to me about the company, things that they learn from competitors they're talking to. And, and uh, you know, for the most part, they have pretty fond memories, and, and we even hope to hook them in a little bit like we did with Joe, and we're, we're still doing with Ryan. I spoke with Taylor the other day, and uh, so we keep in, keep in track of people. But uh, I hear this time and again, we have some of the smartest people. Uh, and you know, we brought this woman, Patrice, to, to uh, interview our senior managers and to give us advice. And uh, I think she used the word wicked smart uh, for some of the people that are are your leaders here. So it's uh, pretty pretty moving to me to know that we have people that we go track that down because smart people like working with other smart people. We're success oriented. Um, you know, our track record is uh, extremely good, as many of you have heard in other presentations, and it's because of the people in this room. Um, we have a, a growth vision. You know, if you're really good at something, you want to do more of it. Uh, I think that's human nature. Um, and we need to keep attracting future people that are smart, young people, people uh, in other jobs. So we'll be looking as, as we grow. And uh, I think all of you have heard me say this before, that the most important asset that we have is in this room. And we go home at the end of the day and hopefully come back uh, on Monday. Uh, so keep in mind people that you respect out there that you might want to join uh, RCS and, and uh, talk to Judy or Beth about people who might uh, think we should recruit because uh, we need more of them as we grow. The other thing, uh, the third S uh, that I came up with was uh, secure. Uh, 
that hasn't always been the case at O'Reilly uh, and Santa Fe. You know, we're hell bent for election, we didn't have a lot of cash. Uh, you know, we owned a lot of real estate. We'd go up and down with the market. We're pretty good about, as Duke indicated, getting in at the right time, getting out at the wrong time, and harvesting profits. But uh, over the decades, uh, I think we've become very, very secure. So uh, I know some of you want to be partners, and we invite that and encourage that. And some of you want to make sure that we go through a recession and have turbulent times, that the company can afford to keep you as an employee. We're tough, but we're fair. And uh, because people make the business, uh, we're going to keep our people. And you'll find out uh, when we do Ian's section that you work for a secure company, one that's uh, profitable and uh, does a very good job, financially healthy. So uh, the result is, you know, we're ready. Um, we're ready for whatever uh, the market gives us. So I guess we went ahead. There we go, go back to this. Um, so um, let me go back. I'm sorry, it seems to, um, we jumped, uh, jumped the slide. Um, so, uh, to achieve the success of the last 30 years, we want to get into what did it take. Well, uh, all of you signed the universal uh, principles. We also have a set of leadership principles that I just looked at again this morning. Just quite a few of them. Uh, they're all the things that if you, if you had a day or two to sit down and jot, uh, they're things that you would want your managers to have and we would want our managers to have. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, but in a nutshell, if we can live the universal and the leadership princi uh, principles, we're going to remain very, very successful. Um, basically, what they say is we're committed and we're hardworking. And we have a mission, and the mission is uh, to, to deliver great results to be top 5% in the industry. We're pretty sure by most objective measures, we're at least in the top 10. Ian and I keep on watching it, and uh, we seem to be consistently there. I'm not sure if we're quite at the five. You know, we're certainly better than ten, but uh, there's some pretty strong companies out there. But uh, our goal is to be in the top five, and I think we're able to do that again because of the talent that we have uh, in this room. You know, we went over the tenure of some of the employees. Uh, Sharon, I think that. Uh, is working at the foundations now, member of the family office, but I think she's at 39. Well, part of it is how you count it, right? Because she worked for me in a prior company, so that's more than 40 if you add that in there. But if you look at the expertise in the company, we're almost at 500 years of talent in real estate sitting in this room uh, working together, um, 409 to be exact. Uh, so that's an amazing. Uh, stability, I don't think a lot of real estate companies can make that claim. As Judy said, a lot of our success is acting on a macro view and a deep analytics. Many of you are extremely good at analysis of deals, and uh, I've been told time and time again that our packages are some of the best uh, that are out there, so I'm, I'm proud of it. And I think that our investment track record is partly because of that rigorous analytic approach. In other words, um, we look at things very carefully, we analyze the risk, we understand the risk, and when the risk happens, we know how to defend, defend ourselves against it. And I would say that analytic approach has spread throughout the organization and become part of our sustaining DNA. On the macro part, we're less successful. That's my job, which is try to figure out where things are going. And uh, obviously, I have a lot of help from Ian and uh, Steve and Dan. Uh, and it turns out that the economy is something that nobody can really predict with accuracy. Uh, but what you can do is monitor it carefully, and there are indicators, like there's some very classic indicators that a recession is pretty likely. In real estate, you can actually predict what's going to happen because the indicators in, in a contained industry, the indicators are more reliable. You don't have to worry about China if you own an apartment building in Broomfield, but you do have to worry about all the cranes that are uh, sprouting around uh, in Broomfield, and 
And so if you have overproduction of apartments, you have a very reliable formula for a collapse in, in, uh, in values. Um, but uh, on the economy, you have to be a little more modest and say if there's a recession, here's what we're going to do, and if there isn't, here's what we're going to do. Um, creating an entrepreneurial real estate culture, well, you know, I'm a classic entrepreneur, and uh, I think part of the, the company's success is is based on that creativity and the ability to adapt and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and entrepreneur is that French word, which means between bringer. And so the entrepreneurs got to went down to get the fish and the fishermen bring it to the marketplace to uh, sort of maybe add value along the way. Um, and so the goal for sustaining RCS is to continue to build that entrepreneurial class within the company and it helps drive succession. Uh, you notice less and less of me over time, and you know, it's a very healthy thing at my ripe old age. Uh, and so employee partners is something we encourage all of you to think about. How do I become an employee partner? And those leadership principles will help you. Uh, we now have 14 key employees who co-invest alongside me, and I'm happy to report that uh, six of them are independently wealthy, at least by my standard. Uh, a few of them have uh, you know, people have moved on, and uh, like I said, we're in touch with them. Uh, but going forward, RCS really wants you to consider that program, how to become a partner, because that's the, the key difference, I think, between RCS and some other organizations. Um, that end vision that we have uh, in that little uh, diagram that Dan put together. Uh, is that RCS is 80% owned by the employees and 20% owned by the foundation. And so that's our aim, our end point. And so the other 80% is all up for grabs uh, over a period of time, uh, you know, during the transition. Um, and I hope that many of you in the room are able to partake of that and to become uh, either real estate investors uh, from that part of the level perhaps uh, shareholders. Um, so moving on, you know, we talked about this, and I guess it slide skipped ahead, so I won't repeat this. Um, but basically at the bottom, um, I think we could we could talk about uh, that result. We didn't get to that. Uh, as Judy indicated, uh, it's not just us, but a lot of people are worried about a recession. I think the um, a recession creates problems, but it creates um, tremendous opportunity for someone like us. If you have uh, creative solutions, you can solve problems, and you get paid a lot for solving problems. The more complicated the problem, the more you get paid. That seems to be a work, the way it works. And so a bad market is a great opportunity for us, resulting in new success. So we're not afraid of a recession. We've been preparing for a recession for years. Um, 2019, when you heard that word come out, we had the flash recession in 2020. It came and went before it burped. Uh, it was pretty interesting. But, um, you know, we will thrive during the recession. In talking to Joel Bauer, some of you know, he said, uh, he said, survive until 25. And I'm going to change that. I just heard it this morning. My my expression is thrive until 25, and then coast, uh, because we can thrive. We're an unusual company. We're built for problems, uh, and in the meantime, the success will apply to you. Um, each of you can be sure of a safe job. There's going to be a lot of opportunity. We'll have a slow year this year. Like Judy said, it's a year to get ready uh, for a big time. Um, and some of you, if you want, can, can step up and try to get into that partner mode. Uh, and in order to do that, you're going to want to read about the, uh, the leadership principles. Uh, so let's talk about where we are uh, at this point. I've been calling it the great disconnect. And the great disconnect, what he said, is what the hell's going on, where are we going. Uh, it seems that somebody threw the playbook out the window, and we're all trying to scratch our heads. Uh, the Fed, as it says, aggressively raised interest rates and withdrew liquidity. Inflation is now embedded and persistent. They increased the Fed funds rate by over 400 basis points. It's the fastest rate climb in over 40 years. And, uh, you know, the 
shock the system. So as cap rates go up, interest, I mean, sort of as interest rates go up, cap rates pretty much have to fall. But they follow with the lag. So when Joe and, and the team at Meridian were talking to us about industrial, they were saying, well, there, well the brokers are telling them that cap rates will probably go up 50 basis points. That's 50, and then another 50, and then another 50. We forgot to tell you about the second and the third round of cap rates going up. But if interest rates keep on going up, then cap rates have to fall. Follow and you know, that ain't good news if you're in real estate. We saw values begin to uh, to uh, flatten in 2022, the first half, and then it began to soften pretty unmistakably, soften in the second half. Uh, there's at risk sectors that we're watching very carefully. You've heard about office, um, we'll look at our office space, right? It's uh, work from home three days a week. Uh, Come into the office too. We don't need all that space. You know, if we could figure out how to put two teams in place, there are ways of shrinking your office space if you have a hybrid model. Um, so office is is being uh, trashed uh, out there in the economy. I can tell you stories. I won't bother bother you with apartments. Uh, we talked about the cranes. Uh, there's a lot of overbuilding going on. Big uh, big supply coming on. It'll take a few years. But uh, rents are already starting to fall now. I think it's the third month in a row where rents are falling. And they're they're going to keep on falling for a couple of years. Uh, and then the sharp increase in interest rates and the drop in liquidity means a recession is very likely. That's the classic sign of an inverted yield curve. And all commercial real estate will get that, uh, whether it's land, housing, uh, you pretty much name it with high interest rate and struggles. Um, so, an economic slowdown, uh, not just because of interest rates, but an economic slowdown erodes your occupancy and lowers your rents. Uh, as Meryl knows, watching our projects up in, in Williston when the jobs went away in, a couple of years ago, uh, in the oil patch, uh, occupancy fell, rents, uh, we had to fight like that on rents, and the value of our property fell, unfortunately, is coming back. But that's what a recession does. Um, in the past couple of years, the Fed and Congress uh, passed out easy money. In fact, I just uh, finished a book on it. It was pretty compelling. Um, and I, I, uh, I've come up with an expression. The Fed has made us stupid rich. But guess what? <laughs> They're changing it now. They're pulling the money back and raising interest rates. And there's going to be two groups of people going forward. There's going to be the stupid poor that didn't prepare for it, and then there's going to be the people that said, okay, they gave us a gift, now we're taking the gift away, we need to manage our business without it. So there's opportunity. But the opportunity are only, is only for the prepared. If you're way over your skis and you, you're, you don't have a good safe stance, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the opportunity. So the disconnect or the recession, I think by next year, as Judy is indicating, uh, there's going to be some real distress, uh, and values will be down, and we'll be, it'll be a piety contest for us. Uh, we'll be buying everything we can. But for 2023, it's going to be a reasonably slow year, we believe. Uh, we're prepared for different scenarios. We're not quite sure what the markets are going to give us. Uh, but um, I think, uh, at, at a minimum, we're going to be focusing on safe. Uh, single tenant net lease deals like the BAD deal uh, that we bought in uh, Cedar Rapids recently, 20 year lease, safe deal, international credit. And we're going to pick up some value add deals like the, the uh, Edmonton building that was empty up in Canada. So uh, as you look down the road, now that we've sort of framed uh, what the world looks like, I think that the company basically gravitates into two major initiatives. We've been doing some of it all into one bucket, but if you look down the road at uh, succession, uh, you end up with what uh, Bob Mueller called, uh, as we were discussing, he called it Safeco, uh, a safe company. Um, so we're going to continue buying high credit single tenant net lease deals like the JDA deal. Uh, and we're going uh, we're gonna to stay in, in the safe deals for the time when I'm no longer here. So that the foundations, uh, 
can enjoy very safe long-term cash flows so the Cinda doesn't have to manage uh, the chaos that I've created uh, and the foundations have a stable lifetime and dependable income. Um, it's easy and safe. It's not dependent on me buying and selling and you know wheeling and dealing. Uh, and that the Safeco part of our business will expand. It has been expanding, but over the next three to five years, we'll be buying safe real estate, putting it away for the long term. Roco, that's something you're probably all more interested in. Safeco will pay the salaries, Roco will, will offer the opportunities. Uh, and that goes on for a good period of time. Uh, I believe that the great recovery, as it says here, will follow the great uh, disconnect. Great recession, not the moment the great recession is a great recession. Um, distress values will recover. Uh, so I think by uh, the end of uh, 2024, um, you know, real estate should bottom and the deals uh, should be very much on sale. Um, so uh, there's higher risk and uh, higher reward, but as it says, that will be available for those people that are um, at a lot of cash, have the courage, and are positioned to act. Uh, I believe that's us. Uh, so the goal with this, uh, in a more graphic uh, form, uh, I'll basically show you what, what, what has been happening and what should happen. Uh, the bottom graph is interest rates. So you can see here that uh, <coughs> During the COVID recession, that lowered interest rates very precipitously to try to get the economy going. Congress sent checks out to everybody who could walk or talk, and uh, there was a boom. And so you saw cap rates go down, created that boom. And uh, we were buying safe real estate during that period. And I'm glad we didn't buy a lot of unsafe real estate. Uh, assuming that, that interest rates would stay low. So uh, you can see cap rates are already going up. We project it'll go up. They're only about 25% of where they're going to go. They're going to go up pretty high, and uh, that means the real estate bubble is over and there's going to be a bit of a crash. And you can see Groco emerging and buying all of that stuff after values have fallen or cap rates have gone up. We believe the recession causes the Fed to lower interest rates. It's classic. They do it every time. They have to do it pretty much. And then interest rates stable, and we end up with a good long term future. So that's the you know the next several years in a nutshell. Uh, you see this graph before. This is RCS looking into the future, and uh, the various parts of the graph are where we're going to be operating. So at the bottom of the graph is Safeco, right? So the green part at the very bottom below that dotted line, uh, it's lower but safe returns. Uh, the yields start at maybe 6%, depending on the deal and the loan that you get. Then the yields go up to about 10%, which is great for a foundation and somebody that wants to put coupons, uh, you know, like send in a foundation. There'll be limited buying and selling. It's hold for the duration. Um, if you buy and sell and you're you're pretty good at it, you can squeak out uh, returns by selling at the top of the market, buying at the bottom. Um, that will be done by the top part of the pyramid, vertical. So that, that initiative basically has two parts. The first part is the very top where I'm going to be placing my money. I'm sitting on a lot of cash, as many of you know. Um, and I'm going to start at the riskiest end of the pyramid at the top end. The returns are very high. They should be 25 plus based on this. Could be 20, could be 18, could be 30. We honestly don't know. But uh, it's mostly distressed real estate. Um, it's high risk uh, because we'll be buying buildings like uh, Adam and his team did uh, up in Canada, an empty building. Start with an empty building, it doesn't get much riskier than that. Um, and uh, it'll take a team of people that know what they're doing. Uh, Judy's asset management team, the banking team, uh, you know, they take investors that understand what they're doing and are willing to support us. Um, uh, and they'll take a detailed plan. Uh, and we know how to do this. Uh, like Judy said, it's been in our DNA for a long time. 
And uh, it requires my personal guarantee, as most of you know. We got a very good loan on the deal up in Canada. But you know, we looked at an empty building and normally they wouldn't have done it, but you know, with my credit and sponsorship, uh, they were only for the loan. Uh, so this will be hopefully the last period where I have to get out there and do a lot of bank guarantees, but I'm expecting we'll have to do the loans. The banks really believe in us because they know that we have the capability of paying them off even if the deal doesn't work. And so, you know, we didn't used to be any profit, any more popular than anyone else because our guarantee was didn't matter so much. Now as the banks sort through uh, people that are coming into or are coming out of a recession, um, you know, that sponsorship is going to matter a great deal. Um, you know, road code deals are definitely more complicated. Uh, they're more rewarding. And here's the good news. They're wealth building. They work very well for the investors because they make a very good return. And they work very well for RCS employees. The, the employees, uh, partners that I mentioned, are actually make a little more money than I do because they get to pick and choose deals. So they're a little smarter than me. It would appear because I buy pretty much everything that I think is a good deal, and they get to buy the ones they like. And, but in any event, I'm, I'm proud of the returns they make. But it's very wealth building, and we're going to have a talk on building wealth. Uh, we'll do that next month. Uh, we're preparing Dan, Ian, and I are preparing spies, and we'll help you out, those of you who would like to have a nice nest day when you're 50 or 60 or whenever you want to retire. Um, you know, we can show you how, how to do it, not only in my case, but in other cases, you know, I've helped other entrepreneurs uh, figure it out. Um, I, I won't get into it now, but uh, it, it's kind of fun because uh, it's, it's actually not all that complicated, but it requires a certain amount of discipline and, and, and the ability to courage to invest and to invest. Um, but anyway, it worked out very well. Broco will work out very well for the people that are in this room, those of you who want to participate. And then in the middle is the new initiative um, that we're going to talk about today, which is funds. So RCS, uh, at Adam's uh, suggestion about a year ago, we started investigating funds, and I've been, uh, I've been a founder of, of one fund, uh, the Florida Valley Fund, and I've uh, I participate in other funds. I'm a strategic advisor in a couple of funds. So I sort of know the fund business more or less. Uh, you know, it hasn't really been my cup of tea, but for the reasons that we're going to go over, I think um, I think it's going to be important that uh, that RCS take that seriously and move into the fund business. So on the next slide, um, we talked about that phase one. In, in a nutshell, phase one is me and the investors place our cash. Okay, so between us, uh, I don't know what every investor has. I know what I have, and some of you do. I can buy at over a billion just on my own, well over a billion. And so we have about two billion today, and uh, I can easily, because of all the cash that we have from selling the real estate, uh, you know, we can buy at least a billion, hopefully it'll grow to a billion and a half as values recover. Um, but, you know, our goal is to do that. Again, probably not this year, but next year for sure. Uh, if the stress levels are high, then the fear levels are extremely high. So here's the bad news. You go to a bank and you go, what are you thinking? I've got a whole bunch of bad loans here and uh, I don't trust anybody. And you say, no, 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 it's us. We're different. And uh, we talk them into it because of a reputation. And banks got to make loans, right? They go out of business if they don't make loans. So eventually you get it done. But picture a market where real estate <coughs> is falling. And you're talking to your investors and they read the Wall Street Journal and, you know, they're throwing up because they don't know that if their apartment building is worth what it used to be and what it ain't. But anyway, it's, it's uh, it, you know, and you probably can't do a fund next year if you're in the middle of a recession, because people just don't think that way. Uh, but if you have high fear, you actually have uh, better opportunities. Um, as Rothschild <coughs> says, uh, you're supposed to buy when there's blood in the streets. And you guys have heard me tell the story of one of my investors, and he said some of that blood's mine, and so he wasn't able to invest. Plus, he had plenty, by the way, plenty of money left over. But, 
we couldn't talk into it. You know, it's just like, oh my God. You know, I said, we predicted this. We predicted it would happen. We, now is the time to do it. He said, I just can't. You know, I'm scared. Uh, you know, and that happens to all of us. And that's one of the reasons why we're very analytic. You don't want fear or greed to influence your decision. This is a math game. Okay, if you play it right, you play it by math. You don't get fear overrule you, you don't get greed overrule you, it's a math game. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, um, courageous investors will be, some of them will be running for the hills, and, you know. Believe me, I've been there before, and I know how to write a check. And it won't always work out, that's a, a whole different problem, but, you know, um, it, it, in, in the aggregate, it will work out. So, uh, I guess in summary, Safeco will have a, uh, a, a reasonably big acquisition here because, you know, we're going to be concentrating on those kind of deals. Um, but the track record that we have uh, will help us a lot in getting the fund. You know, if they're in the fire, let's say the top 10% of, uh, you know, pretty sizable real estate companies, uh, it's, you know, you, you easily fit. But by the way, the real estate companies I'm talking about are fund companies because we can get all the data on them. So when I say we're in the top 10%, let's say we're in the top 10% of anybody who's running a real estate fund because we can get all the information on that. You can't get the information on Charlie next door. Um, so here's a question. Why are we doing a fund? Um, well, um, you know, basically, um, it provides future growth uh, for RCS after me. Uh, a lot of the key investors like Hans and, you know, Conrad Schubert, they're getting older. We're all aging, but they're a little ahead of us. Uh, and uh, many of these people uh, are dependent on me. They know me, they trust Adam, they trust Judy, they trust Ian. But if I kick the bucket, I'm not sure they're going to write the same level of checks. You know, I can't guarantee that. It's kind of like, well, maybe we sit out for a couple of years. I mean, you're 78, you're sitting out for a couple of years, it's hard to get back in. I, so I'm not sure that, uh, you know, if we do the, the current model we're doing, I'm not sure that we can keep all of our investors. A fund, on the other hand, is a, a commitment of X amount of money for a period of time, usually five to seven to nine years. So once you get a $400 million fund, the company knows its future for the next several years. That $400 million will buy you, let's say, a billion two or a billion four or something like that. You've got it wired for several years. You don't have to pick up the phone and ask Hans if he's going to do a deal. Um, it's very important for the talent at RCS. It's very important because they continue to apply their expertise. Safeco, eh. It's, it's a good job, but, you know, it's not all that exciting. You get the same check that goes up a little bit for 20 years. you got to manage property and all of that, but it ain't quite the same as buying and selling. Um, so this company has a lot of very talented people, and by getting uh, a new source of capital that isn't mine, because most of mine over a long period of time goes to foundations, I'm able to take care of Cinda and the foundations. I'm able to put some of my money into the fund, and the fund is, uh, you know, hopefully a perpetual thing. In other words, you'll do one fund, two fund, three fund, etc. And so, the knowledge of, of real estate and the use of analytics that's in our DNA gets to be applied, um, you know, for pretty high value stuff. So, as it says, our investors will have continued opportunities. So, if you want to do a fund, I've talked to several people in the last several weeks that one funds, uh, two of them are on fund number five, and uh, one of them's on. I'm going to discuss acquisitions. So before I touch on the accomplishments of the acquisition department, I'd like to take a minute to discuss the challenges that we had to overcome this last year. And many of these challenges will continue to persist this year. So we had the highest inflation rate since the 1980s interest rates hit a 20-year high. There is the biggest land war in Europe since 1945, and there's been declining economic growth and recession risk. The debt markets withdrew this last year. There is a lack of bank liquidity in the market. Many of the lenders are concerned about being overexposed to real estate. 
Some of the banking institutions have stopped lending, like the money center banks. Lenders are now only working with their best borrowers, like RCS. We're seeing lower loan to values. At the beginning of the year, and, uh, about a year and a half ago, we were getting 75 to 80%. Now, it's more like 60 to 70, with the exceptional 75%. We're seeing spreads widening significantly. So at the beginning of 2022, interest rates were about 3%. We locked in the JEA deal for 2.9% in February. As we proceeded with our acquisitions later in the year, we financed BAE at 5.65% and Polaris Distribution Center at 675 Unfortunately, we're projecting the lending environment to continue to deteriorate this year. So as a result of these challenges, U.S. commercial transactions fell. So if we look back at 2020 during the pandemic, what did the Fed do? It came in and provided quantitative easing, lowered interest rates, which created a jolt for 2021. Transaction volumes went up and so did prices. Well, as inflation increased, the Fed reversed course and went to quantitative tightening. It increased interest rates, and that had an impact. And sales volume went down, along with property values. So if you look at the sectors for 2022, what you'll find is industrial and retail volume um, held off fairly well, and retail volume actually increased, but office and apartment sales decreased. If you really zero in on the year, what you'll find is at the beginning of the year when the interest rates were lower, volume was way up. And then the second half of the year as interest rates increased, that volume decreased. So we expect further transaction volume to, to, to decline this year. So as Marcel and Judy mentioned, our record of success relies on being a highly analytical shop. Our strategy is continued to be defensive, buy safe and reliable yields through SDNL acquisitions. The strategy has enabled us to maintain flexibility while preserving capital and attracting new capital. We started to find opportunistic value add deals abroad, along with some retail deals here domestically. We expanded our presence in international markets. We bought our second deal in Canada. We bought two warehouses in Mexico and a retail deal in Puerto Rico. Close the year with 642 million of acquisitions, over 13 properties. What's even more impressive is we've closed 1.3 billion over the last two years. So if we look at actual versus budget, as I mentioned, we closed 642 million. The budget was a billion for this year. This was a dynamic year for us. We had 1.2 billion on the books between the under contract and closed deals through the middle of the year. Market conditions changed, so we elected not to proceed with those acquisitions. We only wanted to do the best deals. So we slowed acquisitions looking for those deals, and Judy and her team uh, pivoted to more dispositions. Regardless of all the challenges that happened this last year, this was a very successful year for the company. It was one of our best years in acquisitions. Acquisitions by initiatives. SDNL, 76% of our deals were weighted. 24% was in value add up or opportunistic. This is very similar to how we performed in 2021. Close 486 million in SDNL deals. At the beginning of the year, it was Bosch Distribution Center, which was in West Memphis, Arkansas, it was a sell lease back with them. 15 year lease term, $53 million deal. We closed Schlumberger's campus, an office building in Houston, Texas. 11 years at least, $105 million deal. Amazon Mexico, we closed two uh, Amazon facilities, one in Lyon, the other one in Merida, $57 million, and it was about 10 and a half uh, years at lease term. We did a sell lease back with a law firm in West Virginia, Steptoe and Johnson, $23 million deal, 23 year lease, or 20 year lease. Oryx portfolio, this was an oil and gas initiative in Odessa, Texas, $8.1 million transaction, 20 year lease. BAE systems, 
We bought from our partners, Ryan Companies. Uh, brand new building. BAE is the seventh largest defense contractor in the world. Paid 107 million. Express Scripts. This one's a little bit of a hybrid between value add and SDNL. About six years of lease term. Got a great cap rate, 10 and a half, $37 million deal. And then JEA headquarters. Most of you have probably seen this deal uh, or had us talk about it the last couple of years. We, pre we provided the prep equity for the development. Our partners were running companies, and then we committed to a forward sell. So that finally closed in November of 22, $95 million deal, 20 year lease with Jacksonville Electric Authority in Florida. Close to 155 million of value add and opportunistic deals. Two of these deals being with our partner, Lamar. The Puerto Rico portfolio, 80.2 million, and shops at Valley Square, 60 million. Under our oil and gas initiative, we closed Landmark Suites, a hotel, for 4.7 million in North Dakota. And then finally, we eat this one through at the end of the year, Plurus Distribution Center, vacant warehouse in Edmonton, Canada, 11 million USD. So before we look at future growth, I want to take a look, walk down memory lane. So the company commenced in 1983. During 07 and 08, we acquired STNL deals, similar to what we were doing now, but a little bit smaller back then. The company was renamed to RCS in 2010. And as some of the RCS veterans know, we were called Colorado Santa Fe before then. We've always been a nimble organization and being able to adapt to market conditions. If you look at 07 and 08, the bars there are white, which represent SDNL. Then moving forward, you see a bunch of different colors. Well, we went to apartments, condos, home building, and then commercial, which is the gold ones. Now we're back in SDNL again. However, what really stands out to me is the success of this company is no longer through an individual. We, it's, but instead it's through exceptional managers and dedicated team members. This is what excites me the most, is working with all of you within this room and the continued growth of the company, because this is just the start. 2023 strategy. It's going to be very similar to what we did this last year. So we're going to remain in the SDNL sector. Why remain in SDNL? Well, if there's a recession coming, this is a great sector to be in because we get a reliable yield and a low risk. We're looking for long-term leases, 15 to 20 years, and we want investment grade credit or near investment grade where there's a low default risk. We're going to continue to find best-in-class partners like Lamar, Ryan Companies, Lowe. And then one new category this year is going to be rescue capital. So a lot of our competitors out there are probably going to find themselves in some trouble. They're either going to need equity infusions, um, loan payoffs, loan paydowns, help with refinances. And this is also how we're going to attract new partners to the organization. We're going to continue to seek opportunities uh, in Canada and Mexico, along with other markets, and then here domestically. So for people that are new to the organization, we use investment clocks to help guide our investment decisions. The clocks are proprietary to RCS and have been automated to allow for real-time analysis. Office Adler, it's out for now. Uh, Marcelo already mentioned why we don't want to be doing office. Work from home has caused vacancy rates to increase, and it suddenly spaces that record high. This doesn't mean the acquisition team isn't going to do an office building uh, this year. We may find a really compelling deal out there that just makes sense, but we're, we're definitely not loading up in the sector. Industrial outlook, rare buy. We'll still be selectively buying, but there's been risk of overbuilding and vacancy rates are starting to increase. Apartment outlook, rear buy as well. So we'll be selectively buying in the sector, hopefully in the second half of the year. We'll be concentrating on A properties and markets with strong job growth. Over the last couple of years, the sector has had tremendous rent growth and depending on the location, 
it's been 20 to 25 percent. Now we're starting to see that rent flattening now, and there's been substantial development within this sector. So we've seen starting to see vacancy rates increase. Retail outlook. So retail outlook is a qualified buy. The darling of the sector used to be apartments and industrial, and now it's retail. Um, so shopping centers are still holding up. Vacancy levels are actually going down and rents are rising. So what we found out is after the pandemic, people still wanted to go to the store and shop physically. They didn't want to order everything online. Yields have been more attractive too. So yields didn't compress the last couple of years as in other sectors. So as interest rates have been increasing, it hasn't really impacted values too much. And lastly, within the sector, there hasn't been much overbuilding. And so that's another reason as to why rent growth has been increasing. 2023 acquisitions in progress. We about have about 100 million under contract or awarded. One of the more exciting deals is the Louisville Cavern. We've been working on this thing for about a year. Finally got it under contract about two weeks ago. $71 million deal, and uh, assuming that uh, passes due diligence, will close in May. Cambridge Crossings, this is a retail deal with our partners Lamar in New Jersey. $22 million deal, expected to close in April. And then we're also looking at doing a dip loan with our partners EFO on a land parcel in Beverly Hills, California. And with that said, too, the acquisition teams out there working ferociously trying to get more deals. So I'm hoping that 100 million is going to increase to like 200 or 300 million uh, over the next month or two. But uh, moving forward, we got major growth plan from 24 to 20, 27. We're going to expand acquisitions with more sales capital and outside capital. The goal is is to buy 600 million of real estate this year. We project acquisitions to be lower, uh, just given the challenges that I outlined earlier. But after 2023, we project to deploy more capital into value add, uh, commercial and apartments, and less into SDNLs. So as the recession hits and opportunities emerge, we're going to refocus that capital to more of the uh, opportunistic type returns. We're going to continue to watch and act on the real estate macro and then pile in when the time's right. And then after we diversify our capital base from ourselves, we're going to move into a fund in 2026. And as you'll see here in the, the chart, we'll hopefully get, be getting to that buying level of over a billion a year. Capital raise. So RCS has an excellent platform for I have an excellent platform and track record to attract capital. Major ranges for 2022 included Puerto Rico, Slumberger, Bosch, and JEA. Equity raised thus far in 2023 is approximately 7.3 million. Aurora Polaris has a $3.6 million raise. We got it fully subscribed relatively shortly. We also just closed about 3.7 million for uh, the first round on Amazon Mexico, and we have about 9 million left or so to raise under that, and we have some very good prospects. But even with this success, we've had a gap in the capital markets team, and leadership will be focused on rebuilding the team for major capital growth moving forward. This year and next year, outside capital raise will be lower as we deploy more sales capital, since he's still sitting on about 400 million himself. And then after we place more sales capital, we'll move to that fund in 2026, which is targeted to be 400 million. Now, Marcel already mentioned, you know, what the positives of moving to a fund, but as I look at it, it's just more of a secure capital base for us here at RCS, and it allows us to scale our acquisitions. But regardless of what we do, we're, we're still going to be a highly successful company. Uh, we have highly talented people, we have long company tenure, and we produce the best in class returns. We'll have more sales capital, legacy investors continue to grow with us, and senior leaderships working with new investors. 
And that's all the keys to success. So with that, I'll bring it over to Judy and she'll discuss operations. Thanks, Adam. So on the operations side, I'm gonna go over dispos first. As, as um, Adam said earlier, we, we pivoted actually in 21 to increasing our dispositions and certainly in early 22 we were very successful. As you can see here, we had our best year ever. It's 474 million of dispositions versus 366 million in 2021. It was lower than the budget of 511, but that budget actually included 157 million from Amazon Albany, which as many of you might remember or might recall, we actually had um, under LOI and under contract at the beginning of the year. So it was in the budget. If you didn't have, it didn't sell, by the way, I think most of you know that. If we didn't have that in the budget, the budget would have been 354 million. So we would have far surpassed our budget with dispositions. We had a lot of deals that we did not expect to sell, such as Wyomissin, Heartland, et cetera, that, uh, that ended up selling at the end of the day. And we, we, we sold them just in time. The, the big sales were in the first uh, couple of quarters, first three quarters, slowed down significantly uh, at the end of the year, just as our acquisitions did. Uh, interest rates weren't, uh, weren't on our side. And we do, we do suspect it'll be a somewhat lean year uh, in 2023 as far as dispositions go, just as it is going to be a somewhat lean year for acquisitions. For the same reason, we're not desperate sellers. We're going to, we're going to wait and hold out for the better pricing as, as interest rates go down and cap rates fall as well. As, as far as the breakdown of the portfolio goes, you can see on a square footage basis, we've got about 86 properties, 14.8 uh, million. You can see the biggest, uh, in, in terms of category, uh, industrial and office are the two biggest. Uh, however, I don't want to scare you too much. I know, you know most of you, like, like our lenders, think office is a four-letter word, and, and to some degree it is. Uh, not all of it, but uh, a lot of that office is actually in the STNL category, um, so, so don't be too concerned about that. The STNL portfolio, on a square footage basis, actually comprises about 6.6 .6 million of that 14.8 or 44%. Um, that's up from 29% in 2021, so you know, it's, it's, and it's going to continue uh, in, in 2023, as Adam said. We're going we're gonna to be piling into kind of more safe harbor STNL assets for the next year, um, waiting for the real opportunities to come. The opportunistic deals uh, comprise a little over 8 million of our portfolio, or 56%. But we predict that that's going to change over the next few years. Um, as Marcel and Adam alluded to, we're going to have some pretty good buying opportunities here um, come late 24, 25, 26, and on. And so this is going to be sort of flipped. We're going to have a few a lower proportion of STNL going forward and a higher proportion of opportunistic. Our hotel assets, uh, we're probably going to invest um, those over the next few years, as we will um, pretty much most of our oil and gas portfolio. On an AUM basis, or value, dollar value, the portfolio is comprised just a little bit differently here. You can see by that pie chart, I'm going to use this little pointer that uh, I was given to see if it works. Yeah, you see this dark line here. This is all of our STNL categories. You can see office and industrial, the two biggest, a little bit of retail, a little bit of flex. That's actually 59% on a dollar value of the entire portfolio. And the entire por portfolio is just over 1.9 billion, as Marcel said earlier. The rest of the assets, the multifamily, <coughs> retail, uh, and industrial flex, uh, comprise the remainder, 41%. Again, as I just mentioned, those proportions are gonna flip um, in the next few years as we buy increasingly, increasing numbers of opportunistic deals and less and less as we're portioned uh, safe harbor deals. This, uh, this chart shows our track record uh, for the last 15 years, since um, early 2008 uh, to the end of 2022. As you can see, we've had a stellar, a stellar track record, uh, overall returns of 25%, uh, the highest returns uh, being just under 31% in the CRE sector. CRE has been our bread and butter since day one. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff we've been investing in since the 80s. Uh, we, we didn't get into some of these other categories like you know, condos and, and development and home building until a bit later, many of them either right before or after the, the Great Recession. But you can see that the spread, it isn't too wide. You know, all the sectors perform really quite well. 
uh, and, and even the STNL, frankly, which, which wasn't really predicted to for, form a mid-teens, more like you know, low double digits, uh, we, we were really lucky there as well. Um, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that the, the remaining portfolio doesn't have some challenges. As you saw in the previous slide, we do have a number of office properties. We're going to struggle a little bit with those over the next few years. There's no two ways about it. Some of them will do just fine. They're in slightly better submarkets. Some of them are going to struggle a little more than others. We overall, though, are not predicting any huge losses. The returns on, the, on that portfolio going forward are going to be a little less than 25, probably more like the teens, but really still very respectable overall. Now I want to talk a little bit about the achievements. Uh, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about the, the acquisitions department, and, and that's great because without them, we wouldn't have anything to work on. So we appreciate that. But all the other departments are important too. So I'm going to start with asset management. As you can see, we 86 projects we ended the year, 1.93 billion in AUM, and that's up from 1.5 billion uh, in 2021. So uh, a pretty pretty good increase this past year. Dispositions had our best year ever, as I just mentioned. 34 dispos, including a number of uh, quite a few partial and cash sales, uh, particularly in, in our retail portfolio. A uh, total of 474 million, our best year ever. On the leasing side, 65 new and expansion leases, totaling over half a million square feet. 50 renewal leases, 450,000 square feet, for a total of 115 new and expansion and renewal leases. And I want to give a big shout out to, to Donna Kirk and Andrea Roos, who uh, helped our team uh, push all these deals through. And without, without legal, we'd never be able to, to close on these, uh, this volume of leasing activity in-house. So I want to, want to thank you guys um, for that. And just some other miscellaneous um, onboarded the very complicated Amazon, Amazon Mexico portfolio. Uh, uh, Meryl, really big shout out to you on that one. I know it was a, an extraordinarily complicated deal. I know you worked really well with, with the tax team and with finance, and uh, it, it, it was the literally the most complicated deal um, that we ever closed, and Rudy would agree with that as well. That was by far the most complicated acquisition in RCS's history. Uh, we also closed on the Aurora Polaris deal, but that was our second acquisition in Canada, so old hat, we breezed through that one in comparison. And overall, there were 13 new deals that we onboarded. 11 of them were RCS in-house, and two of them were Lumar deals. We're our partner on board them. RCS continues to advance its uh, capabilities across the board, so I want to recognize all the other departments as well. On the property finance and accounting side, many of you know it's been a somewhat tumultuous few years. We've had a lot of turnover, but I think we finally have a really great staff. We hired a, a, a new senior property accounting manager very recently, two new senior and one new staff accountant, a senior financial analyst, and also an analyst. And, and really want to, uh, you know, Congratulate the whole team for working together this year. Uh, it's 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 been a lot, as we said, onboarding 13 new projects, creating 29 new general ledgers, and and the dispos as well, uh, eliminating 23 general general ledgers in the assistance of 16 uh, real estate dispositions. Uh, they also made significant progress on the rollout of Juniper Square, which is now we're 95% of the way there. And those of you who are employee investors might notice that we've got a, a slightly different um, platform when you get capital calls uh, and your distributions. So that's been rolled out, and we're uh, I'm told that within weeks we're going to be fully on on board with uh, Juniper Square. So congrats there as well. On the risk management side. Uh, Deborah successfully secured insurance for 1.4 billion portfolio. If you're wondering why that is a little smaller than the 1.9 billion I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's because not all of our insurance is is uh, um, with with Chubb, with our insurance company. Lamar, for instance, has a number of their properties that are not under our umbrella policy, as does um, our, our apartment portfolio is also under a different policy. Deborah processed uh, three claims totaling 400,000, and that's down from six and 1.3 million, and that's actually a good thing. This is where you want the numbers to go down and not up. And she also closed out five Marshall Fire claims with policy limits paid before the end of 2022. Uh, she had a few other claim successes on Old San Jose. We, we settled for 300,000, it's now closed. And manpower uh, was initially denied, uh, but was reconsidered and coverage ended up being offered for all but repair of pipe. There. Corporate accounting and treasury, 
you guys processed three and a half billion wire transfers in 2022, and that's up from just over three billion in 2021. 65 million of checks were cut. That's 57 million average versus 57 million average for the prior three years. 3.4 billion of receipts, and that's compared to 2.1 billion average for the prior three years. And there was over 31,000 transactions and 7 billion, um, uh, totaling 7 billion in 2022. These are huge numbers, uh, absolutely huge numbers. It's mind boggling when you think about it. They also updated the cash management investment policy and enhanced the, the wire request process to make things uh, flow a little more smoothly in that area. And IT and Aaron's department, uh, he, he monitored, he coordinated the transition over to Greystone Technologies early this year I, um, that I'm pretty sure all of you were aware of. That was that happened in the spring, I believe it was April. A little rocky um, in the beginning, but at the end of the day, it was it, it worked out great. And Greystone has been uh, giving us wonderful service for the better part of the year, and they now provide more advanced support and strategic resources for going forward. We also migrated all of our CS IT resources into the cloud, uh, which is big. We no longer are reliant on building power. We almost had a major catastrophe on December 31st of 2021 when the fire hit, had our building actually burned down. We, uh, our, our hard drive was on site, obviously. That would have been a big problem. We would have all been kind of out of work for a few weeks and scrambling. Luckily, it didn't happen. This, this transition mitigates that going forward. It won't happen. Uh, also, as mentioned, uh, the IT uh, helped work with finance to roll out a new wire tool. Makes things a little easier. And we updated RCS to the most current TM1 application, which is the end of a multi-year um, uh, initiative to phase out the old tool. And you continue the shift uh, towards TM1 web, which, by the way, has, uh, for those of you who haven't used it, it, there's a lot of great data and a lot of great reports available on that. And I hope to work with um, the IT team in the coming year on creating even more um, reports that can be used by, by the team, by the asset managers, and by senior management. And last but not least, we have tax and legal. Tax, 653 federal and state taxes were filed and completed, which is a 14% increase over 21. That's thanks to all of the exchanges and MES loans, because as many of you know, when you exchange out of one property into another, that entity doesn't ever go away. So all those entities, it's like a snowball, it's bigger and bigger. So. Jason and his team have a job for life, I think. But they are absolutely one of the best tax teams in, uh, in, in the country, and they assisted in securing and closing 26 exchanges this year, totaling over 360 million. This was a record year for RCS exchanges. That obviously dovetails with the dispositions, because as many of you know, we, we rarely dispose of properties without, um, without 1031 exchanging them. On the legal side, they closed on 13 new acquisitions. They closed their first acquisition in Mexico, again, by far the most complicated closing, so congrats to everyone uh, on that, really. It was a, a huge team effort um, across many departments. They closed 20 dispositions, and they completed 26 1031 reverse exchanges, along with the tax team. And according to Rudy, they closed down lots and lots of loans and refinances and modifications. <laughs> Couldn't keep track of those. Luckily, Rudy doesn't work for the accounting and finance department. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on that note, we're going to move on to financials. Ian, um, Ian stepped away. He wasn't feeling so hot, so thought he would excuse himself uh, just in case he actually caught COVID from Dan Sorrells a couple days ago, so if he's not here, I'm going to go through real quickly the financials. Uh, bear with me, because I, I, I didn't practice these, uh, nor did I develop them, but as you can see right here, we I love this thing, by the way. <laughs> They're very powerful. Um, you can see we had a really good year. Our budget was $1.3 million in net operating income, and we achieved one point, over $1.6 million. It, it's not... It's not finalized, and Marcel's going to come up and add a few words as well. We're not finalized yet. Um, it'll be in a few weeks, but I think you know we're pretty pretty close, and that number shouldn't change too much. You can see we're we're off a little bit on on acquisition and disposition fees. Not much. We're pretty close. Um, we're a little bit higher on management fees, and. Uh, 
we're about a little lower on these other fees. Where we really, uh, you know, we're lower, and, and this is, you know, good and bad. Obviously, it, it helped us on our NOI, but we were quite a bit lower on our payroll and tax. There were a number of people that we had hoped to hire earlier in the year, and we didn't get them hired until later in the year, or or not, or we were still trying to hire them, and that really. It, it, it hurt the team in some respects, but everyone rallied together. You can see, even with the shorter staff, we got a lot done. It's not sustainable. We, we get that. We appreciate everyone's hard work. We get that it's not sustainable, so you know, we obviously don't have that in the budget going forward. But that, that, that did play in quite a bit to this, this profit um, uh, you know, here at $1.6 million. And, and again, as Adam said, you know, the, the slowdown really happened in the second half of the year. Had we you know, had we continued on uh, as we did in the first half of the year and the second half of the year, that number would be much higher, and, and uh, we'd be seeing a, a different too. But luckily, we had we had the successes that we did have in the first half of the year. Going forward, we are predicting, um, and oh well, this is actually past. So you can see here again, best year ever in the last five years, and that really is ever because I don't, prior to 2018, we did not have any anything. So really strong year overall. And uh, going forward, we are predicting, um, well, no, I guess we're not predicting it yet. <laughs> we are, here's the 22 budget compared to the 23 budget. So you see, as I was mentioning earlier, as Adam mentioned, it's gonna be a little bit of a leaner year. So, you know, at management fees are actually up because we, we do have a fair amount under on the management. We're not expecting to, to dispose of many, nor are we expecting to buy too many, although we do have a pretty a, a, a pretty decent acquisition target with all the STNLs, and I am confident that our very capable acquisition team will meet that. They, they're working really hard to turn over every stone um, and uncover all the, the opportunities, even though they are a little, a little bit scarcer and further between. Um, so at the end of the day, we're, we're projecting to be profitable, but not nearly as profitable this year. Um, as last year. And here is where we get to the fun stuff. Whoop. This is where Marcel may want to you know, pipe in here a little bit, but as you can see, this, this was historically what I just showed you. We are predicting a lean year in 23, but then going forward in 24, 25, and 26, we're predicting some pretty steep increases going forward and some pretty exciting years for, for RCS. So, um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And Marcel, was there anything else you wanted to add to that? I think uh, that's very good, Julia. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. And now I want to turn over the, the mic to Bob Euler. Uh, Bob is uh, one of our very trusted advisors for the last five or six years. Many of you don't know him, but uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about his background and, and his company and how he's been working with RCS now for six years? Six years. Thanks. I know some of you, but not many of you, and uh, I thought I'd uh, introduce myself and what I bring to the party, so to speak. Um, I'm a management consultant at the present time. Um, I remember uh, going to a company function uh, once, and uh, I was with a crowd of people, and they came up to me, and they said, I understand you're a management consultant. And I said, yes, I am. And they said, well, he thought they were taller. <laughs> I'm a short management consultant. <laughs> Hopefully not in breadth and green, but uh, in size as such. Um, just to give you a, a little background on, on what I do and why I'm where I'm at, I um, I sort of divide my my life into the four four parts. The first part is a military part, which is a family profession. Uh, going back to the Revolutionary War, I have direct relatives who fought. In, in, we have fought in every war until Vietnam, and that's the war we lost and we stopped fighting after that. Uh, in that. So military was in my blood. My dad was a West Point graduate. I went to West Point, graduated right in the middle of the Vietnam War uh, after graduation. Did uh, arduous training, um, the uh, sort of the same training that a SEAL gets in the Navy. I got in Ranger School. Went over to Vietnam, took over, and became a combat assault officer, uh, and conducted about 25 different combat assaults, uh, including retaking Hamburger Hill, uh, which is a relatively famous uh, battle site uh, in Vietnam. I, uh, I left the military after that because I knew the war was over. 
and I didn't want to be in a conservative, no risk taking kind of business. Uh, I also wanted to be constructive. I wanted to do something to build something, uh, rebuild something, and and so I decided to go back to my roots of engineering, and I went back uh, to the University of Florida and got what was essentially a doctorate degree without a dissertation in advanced water treatment and environment. Uh, that was a new business at that time, uh, and uh, it was a time when Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, was out, uh, uh, contamination and the Clean Water Act was just starting. I thought it would be a wonderful business to be in, and I thought it would be a forum where I could be creative uh, and, 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 and actually put some monuments on the ground that did some good. So I became a design engineer uh, after graduation. I went to a little school, a little tea firm in California that was a boutique, and they only had 28 people, but they were renowned somewhat as the Mayo Clinic of hard, tough, difficult water problems. Um, they only hired from Caltech, Stanford, and Berkeley. I was the first person at the University of Florida to join them, and I was a curiosity to them, to say the least, uh, since they were a little academically uh, snooty. Um, uh, but they were, the, they were the best in what they did, uh, and were called upon across the world to solve tremendously difficult, minute uh, water problems uh, in both industry and state local governments and, 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 and national situations. But it was a small firm. It was only, uh, uh, at the time, I'll, I'll, I will show it to you, but uh, uh, I spent the next uh, 37 years there, um, which seems a little bit boring, but believe me, it wasn't boring. We went on a great trip. Um, at the time, it was conservative, it was technical, it was high tech, and it basically only wanted to solve problems, it didn't really want to grow. Uh, it was a boutique shop as such. When I joined it, uh, I wanted to build stuff. I wanted to design things, sign drawings, register myself as a professional engineer, go out and build them and see that the monuments grow out of the ground and start them up. And that's what I did for the first part of my career with them. And I did that until I got bored. Uh, at the time I got bored, I said, you know what, I'm too entrepreneurial to be doing this. Uh, I've already done it. Uh, so I became a manager of engineers and I started to basically grow offices. Um, I volunteered to move the company's uh, uh, headquarters out to the East Coast and I opened about 14 offices uh, in the course of about eight years. Um, at that time, I got bored doing that. Um, I said to myself, uh, is this all there is? I'm not quite sure this is, this is a, that stimulating. Started reading uh, strategy books and management books. And uh, at age 40, I decided to go back to Harvard Business School. Um, the company immediately came in and said, we don't want you to go because you're gone from the company the minute you do that, uh, and uh, you'll be absorbed into the world. Uh, and so they sent me to Harvard Business School for the purpose of coming back and being the chief strategy for the company, uh, of which I did. And then I immediately uh, basically gave, after being at Harvard, I kind of came up with a grand plan to move this consulting firm into the world's largest water consulting firm in the developed world. That was my vision. And I laid out a vision to them in a, an 11 person operations meeting. Uh, the CEO at the time uh, had believed in, in participatory decision making. And so being that I was the chief strategist, I presented the strategy. It was quite audacious, uh, it was quite aggressive and it was quite out of the world, uh, unbelievable relative to the people there. The vote in the room was nine against and one for when it went around to the CEO. And all for good reasons, risk, we don't know what we're doing, we don't have passport stamps, we don't speak foreign languages, and I was talking about becoming a global firm. 
uh, and buying companies around the world. When I got to the CEO, uh, he said, uh, thank you for your input, and uh, I've decided we're going to do it. Uh, and he said, the reason I'm going to do it is because, you know, about two-thirds of what Bob says is crap. Uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's going to fail. But one-third will get us all the job. One-third will create a different kind of company. And that's really what I think the whole exercise is here. So he, uh, at the end of the meeting, he said, I need you in my office. He came to my office and he said, uh, well, um, congratulations. You got your strategy. Um, now you're going to do it. He said, you, we are base co, and you are new growth co. And you're in charge of new growth co with yourself. And um, pick 40 people in the company and go out and create what you want to create and we'll pay the bills. So remember to be loyal. If you're successful, you'll be hot property. I mean, you'd be loyal because we're paying the bills. So that's what we did, and we went into the last phase of my career with them, which is about, which was 20 years long at that time. The first 10 was to basically grow Nuco, uh, and I'll show you how we grew Nuco in a minute. Uh, and at the end of 10 years, we were about 40% of the volume of the company and 75% of the profit of the company. At that time, he said, we want you to be a CEO. He became CEO, and I was CEO for about 13 years. Uh, during that phase, um, we decided to change strategy and to embrace uh, artificial intelligence and information technology. And so automation became the play of the company in knowledge management. Three years into that effort, we won data magazines Knowledge Management Award in business that year against Honeywell and Ford. Uh, and so we were a high technology uh, exchange with a knowledge management system uh, that linked the world together in this. Uh, and then I retired for 13 years because no one in that kind of environment does anything but surf the next group and go into the beach, and you gotta give people an opportunity to run the next session. So let me show you that, and I'll get into the management consultant part because I think it, it, it's, uh, it's important. This is the growth curve of the company. The company started in 1946, and, uh, and uh, this is this boutique company. It doesn't even show the revenues, it's so small. Uh, and, it's still about, uh, and then I joined, uh, right, right there, the first yellow box is when I joined the company. The second yellow box is when I become chief of strategy. The uh, next yellow box is when I become CEO. And the last yellow box is when I retire from the company. This is a people company, and that is in a smooth curve. Just like Adam's curve is not smooth, this one's not smooth. And those dips are really significant. Those are layoffs of 20% of your population. Uh, you don't have the luxury you have of Marcel bridging the deserts. You act on those, in those periods of time, and you can see we came out of it and recovered each time, which is not, by the way, unusual. If you handle the dip well, you usually burst on the other side of the dip because there's a, in some ways, there's a pent-up demand in that. Um, so this goes to about 1.6 billion, and we were ranked number one in the world in water engineering and construction. Um, so uh, this is the comparison when I joined the company and when I left it. Uh, we had four offices when I started. We had 180 when I left. We were in 41 countries, uh, of which 10 languages were spoke as the base language. Um, uh, we had to make English the uniform language of the company, and we had to basically teach language to our offices uh, in order to be able to participate. Uh, we already on our ranking, that's Engineering News Record, which is our media um, that ranks. Uh, we were 151 in the world, and we were one in 2013, 
and, and the employees got up to, actually that's not 1780, it's actually 8,700 uh, was the number, uh, number of employees we had. Um, so, um, what we found was it wasn't just all about engineering and construction, it had to be about multiple businesses that we created. And we created uh, a bunch of business models that were successful and a bunch of business models that weren't successful. And I would say the ones on the bottom which weren't successful were more important than the ones on top. Uh, all of them required a different business model with a different management style to it. But you can see we uh, did a lot of different things and stayed very focused in one sector, which is water. Uh, but we basically failed in some things uh, in the bottom uh, and had to make decisions to close and, and operate. My belief in this was that, um, as I told, I, I used the term wagon trains. At any one time, we had five or six new wagon trains moving east to west, and about half of them would get massacred in about Indiana, uh, and we had to go out and save the survivors re-employ them into successful wagon trains and start new wagon trains. And these were all new businesses. Many of them had their own logos. Many of them had their own um, P&Ls. Uh, many of them had different kinds of people in them than engineers and builders as such. So we built a pretty complete business uh, out of this. Uh, and I'd say, you know, from my audacious strategy and after coming back to Harvard Business School, we probably got about 80% of it done uh, in that. So um, that's my background, and about 10 years ago is when I actually retired. Uh, I, be, I did not want to compete with my company in the water sector, and yet that's when the phone calls were coming all around the world for me to stay in the water sector and help somebody else do it. Uh, I decided that would be disloyal to my company, so I decided I would not be a content specialist at all in management consultant. I'd be a process consultant. So I started focusing on the process of how companies run, and I worked with several private, private, uh, private equity companies. I probably evaluated 25 companies, and my purpose in those, evaluate the management team, evaluate the strategy, tell us that the management team needs to be replaced, and goodbye. And occasionally when we do a deal, we'd like you to be on the board of directors. And I did this 25 times uh, in, in different businesses. A couple of them we bought, most of them we didn't buy. But I, I found that to be a, a, a terrible model because why would you want to be in any business where you, don't, you, know, you basically look at 25 and buy three? Uh, it's a lot of wasted effort, in my opinion. In that. But that's what the private equity is about, sort of. Sort of. Yeah, and you do that too, in some ways. But, but you probably have a higher percentage than, than private equity does. I met uh, Marcel, uh, actually, while I was still CEO. Uh, my headquarters was in Broomfield. He was starting, not starting, but he was in the foundation, and he was looking for an executive to do something about the world. And there are many local companies in Denver. Uh, and I told him, well, you know, when I'm finished being a CEO, I'll come talk to you, we'll get together. And we did, we hit it off. I like him a lot. I think he uh, uh, is brilliant and he stimulates me. Uh, as, as, and, and, uh, and, and we have a good back and forth most of the time and uh, what we want to do. So uh, what I want to do is I want to talk to you enough about me. And uh, that's my background. And uh, it, Chat a little bit about my observations uh, of, uh, of, uh, of your company. Um, first of all, you know, I, I think it's fair to characterize it, it's a unique business culture uh, from what I've seen. Um, it is uh, analytically driven, but it's a deal culture. It's driven by deals. And that's different than other kinds of businesses. Uh, they're not necessarily driven by deals, they're driven by a continuity of service, uh, which is ever expanding, uh, as in my model was. But deal companies have characteristics about them. Um, 
The first characteristic is the deal is everything and it absorbs all the attention to move the deal from one spot to another to the end. And deals are not timed in any way, so there could be a lot of deals or a few deals. And the factory has to go like this. And that's not in people, that's an effort. And so the factory's overworked a lot of times, and the factory's about right or underworked sometimes. Well, this causes stresses that a lot of companies don't have. Um, it's what's required to be successful, but it creates this we're overworked constantly feeling about this. And it also does something else. Um, one of the characteristics of the company is there's not any time to capture lessons learned, history, and process. So when we contract, we rest, and then we get ready for the next storm. And in the meantime, we don't record anything. We don't put processes into place. We don't have knowledge management. We depend on what's in people's heads in that. And the problem with that is when people leave, they take the knowledge management system with them. And so where we used to say a person leaving our company would cost us half of their salary to replace. I think in this company, it costs you probably three quarters of their salary to replace them if, uh, because of the knowledge in their head going out the door that's not recorded in the knowledge management repeat. Um, the, um, it also creates this thing isn't even uniform across the groups who serve. I mean, between legal and, and, and accounting or whatever, they're all fluxing differently. And as a result, you have compartmentization. Uh, you have not a integrated group on all things, but you have a compartmentized uh, system where groups don't know each other very well, <laughs> quite frankly, in what they do. Nor do they appreciate what they do because it's passing the ball to the next down, down the road a bit. Um, this creates a little feeling of not so much teamwork as you find in other companies that are more integrated, uh, that have more of a, of, of a team throughout the whole process. Um, now these aren't good or bad, this is just fact. <laughs> uh, and you deal with what the consequences of this are, uh, but it also tells you when you walk into a company like this and you walk in, people feel exhausted. Why are they exhausted? You know, uh, and often it's because of this going on with the deals going through the system. Um, the success of the company, quite frankly, in my opinion, watching it, is the analytics. It's the, basically the analytics of looking about what we should do and what we shouldn't do, where we should spend our time, and then it has a really, really strong an, um, acquisition and risk management process in the front end that does a pretty good job of not buying duds. The deals that go through are pretty damn good as it shakes through your system as such. There's also a great quality asset and value added part of this uh, that goes on. Um, also, I think another issue that is not originally you, but all companies right now face is the consequences of COVID. And the whole issue of flex time and in the office, not in the office, are we mentoring young people or not? Is there loyalty to the company anymore or not? All lots of things, there's some downsides and upsides that go on, but it sure is a discontinuity of history as such. There's some people who really suffer under this, and that's the new people coming into the company because there's not a knowledge management system they inherit. And young people who aren't mentored or see uh, mirroring going on in front of them to help them develop as such. The people who are more experienced, capable, can work in silos and do pretty good in this, this new environment we have. I think you're gonna have to reconcile that over time and try to figure out you know, not be framed into two days a week or three days a week, it doesn't matter how many days a week, it's how to make the company successful, uh, one way or another. I also think that there's been a lot of work done on succession and, uh, and 
uh, what I call a company beyond Marcel, for which many people didn't believe there would be a company beyond Marcel. And I think you can see some of the work of sustainability that Marcel's given into this by having funds and waves of new business potential. A lot of those waves are the same kind of waves I did in my company when I developed it. There were waves of new business coming in. In this case, there are waves of new ways of getting money into doing deals and things. There's a lot more thought about what happens if Marcel's not here, uh, either momentarily or suddenly. Um, there's not, they're not shared necessarily and put out on a bulletin board because they change and no one wants to lock in to what those plans are. But I can tell you they're updated and I tell you they're serious and they're much better than any company I've ever been in uh, in terms of their thinking process and their completeness. Um, also, I think um, um, this whole concept that Marcel has put together of Safeco, Broco, um, and Fund and all that, it's really smart stuff because it, it basically takes issues that have been percolating relative to how does he take care of his estate and his family and his foundation? How does he provide a growth platform for you all? How does he do this? It actually solves quite a bit of that in thinking of that vision. And you can't do anything without a vision to start with. So I, I really congratulate you on that. Now, the needs of the company are not insubstantial. You are going to need to integrate and bring in some more chief talent. Chief, chief talent, not chief talent. That's like short management, but it's not chief talent. Chief, chief talent. You have to get a fund, and you have to get people who are experienced in doing that kind of thing. So you're going to have to be receptive to more senior people coming into the company. Truthfully, we haven't brought a lot of senior people into this company. Uh, we've sort of built it from the bottom uh, and in, in the income of the, of the company, and we're going to have to bring in some. Um, I think HR gets a lot of credit for changing the attitude and behavior within the office in the six years that I've seen. I think the issues in terms of teamwork and team meetings, uh, fun gifting, represent and rewarding of people, outstanding stuff. And so I think morale-wise, it makes a difference. And I congratulate the, uh, Judy for you and running what I call the factory and getting more recognition of those people who uh, aren't on the glorious side of the business but are crunching the deals through uh, so effectively. Um, and then I, I just think, you know, my view is this is an excellent company, has excellent results, um, there's a lot of thought into it, and it's decisive. It's a decisive company, it isn't paralyzed by not decision making. It would prefer to make a bad decision than no decision. And that, I think, is the right thing to do. Um, because the worst companies I see is when someone says, who's making a decision? <laughs> what is the decision we're tired of waiting for? Um, and by the way, if you want to say, do I vote in my, uh, my complimentary comments, I'm one of your investors. And I wouldn't be here if, uh, I wouldn't be that if I didn't think you were a great company. So I just want to congratulate you. It's been a pleasure dealing with you. Pleased to talk to you uh, offline. And Judy, it's your show. Thanks, Bob. That was great. So, as you just heard, RCS had a very successful year in 2022, despite the headwinds that we, you know, faced in the middle of the year um, that forced us to switch strategies, as, as Adam mentioned earlier. We continue to be a very analytical shop. We make um, market time decisions, and as a result, 2023 is going to be a bit of a challenge. I'm not going to lie to you, as you saw from those clocks. There aren't very many all-in buy categories and only a couple of qualified buy sectors. But there is a blue sky on the horizon uh, and the promise of many lucrative years to come and a number of opportunities that it will be a lot of fun working with you all on going forward. Um, additionally, as you've heard, we're working on a fund to diversify the capital base and, and for sustainability purposes. I just want to let every one of you know 
that I really value each and every one of you. I am a big believer in the phrase that it takes a village, and it is no different here at RCS. And I really look forward to working with each and every one of you on this next chapter in RCS's life. And, uh, and on that note, I, I just want to say thank you. It's as simple as that. And, uh, and really look forward to many, many more years with all of you. So on that note, I will open the floor up to questions and answers. We're running a little bit behind, um, but would like to spend at least 10 minutes on Q&A. And uh, so I think what I'll do right now, again, is open up the floor to anyone who wants to ask questions. And as I mentioned earlier, Beth is coming around with $5 bills, so you know, don't be shy, raise your hand. And got a lot of them, too, so. And you can also ask questions to Bob, you know, and he knows yeah. the company and, and uh, yeah, deep respect for his point of view, his uh, you know, as, uh, as uh, somebody who's been around, uh, uh, I've rated Bob and me, and unfortunately for me, he's much better. <laughs> so you're better off if you were your CEO, but he ain't. <laughs> you have the next best thing, which is he's at our right hand side. And uh, I, I thank him a lot for his advice. He's hard hitting, <clears throat> he's a uh, tough guy. But he is honest and loyal and wicked smart. Um, and so we're lucky to have him. He doesn't have to do this, by the way. He's got a lot of other places he could be. And so um, I think we owe a lot to him. The point is, you're free to ask him questions. The rest of us got biased because we work here, right? Yeah, I will direct those questions to whoever the most appropriate yeah. um, person to answer those. Caitlin. All right, office and said it's not now. Do you see the office coming back? Do you see people going back to the office? Adam, do you want to take that? Sure. That's a good question. <laughs> we'll have to get the magic ball out for that one. <laughs> not in the short term. But I think what, um, you know, if you've looked around even the last couple weeks around the RCS office, you probably noticed that the offices next to us are starting to fill up. So uh, leases are still being done. Um, and what people are finding is you just don't have uh, that group setting and to mentor new employees as they come in doing all this remote work. And so over the next couple of years, it's gonna be tough. And, um, but I do believe office is gonna come back. It may be not be until you know, 25, 26, but it's also going to be bifurcated. So the A properties, the double A properties that have the amenities um, in certain markets, those are already starting to come back. So it's the C properties that are likely that are going to have a lot tougher time this go around. And if you look at what we bought in the great financial crisis and coming out of there, it was more of the Bs and the Cs. And so as we get back into buying those opportunities, it's likely to be on the A properties. But one of the things we're starting to notice is with the Bs and the Cs, the pricing is starting to get so compelling out there that you can, you can also you know, maybe turn it into an alternative use. For the fact where you're looking at land values. So it could be a multifamily building, an industrial building, or something else. Well, not, not exactly. I'm just giving a couple of options here. Development's never really been our forte. Uh, but, you know, if we can do a development deal with a group like Ryan Companies, who specializes in that and um, are quite good, we'd look at that. Thanks, Adam. Who's next? Oh, here Steven. Um, all right, well, I was a two-part question, but I'll turn it to the part. Um, let's say 10 years out from looking back to today. Uh, let's say everything works out perfectly according to plan. Um, and things go really well. What is the thing that you think is like we will have done that made that a success? Like, what is the thing that drew in investors? How did we uh, find them? Like, 
I mean, what's the major thing that would get investors a good reason to invest with us and would lead to us being successful? Well, I'll start to answer that, and then I'll let Marcel and Adam pipe in. I don't think it's any one thing, Stephen. I think, first of all, we have a track record, as, I, as you mentioned, you know, as you saw. We have a 15-year track record that is pretty damn impressive, right? And I think that's what we're going to be building off of. That's what we have been building off of in recent years and with the friends and family investors. We're going to need to do more of that. We're going to need to hire some more expertise. We've got a gap um, since Scott's departure on the capital raise. There's no doubt about it. We, we need to replace that position, and Adam is working real hard on that. And uh, and as Bob mentioned, and even I think Marcel mentioned regarding the fund, I mean, I think to really get that kind of growth that we're talking about, we're going to need to do a fund. doesn't mean that RCS, if we, for whatever reason, decide not to do a fund, RCS is going away. We're just not going to have that same level of growth. <coughs> But if we can if we can pull off a fund, and there's no reason to believe we, we, we can't, you'll see that that really exciting exponential growth. But to do that, we're going to need to hire some more in-house expertise. None of us here have ever run a fund before. Um, it also takes a lot of work. You you got to be out on out doing that dog and pony show all over the country, raising capital the whole bit. I, I'm too old for that. Uh, Adam might not be, but he's he's also running a shop here, and and uh, so we're going to be hiring people to do some of that. And so it, it, it's it's there's no one thing. It's multi pronged, but it is building off of the track record that we've had for the last 25 years. Adam, any, anything to add to that? Uh, it's good market, uh, market timing, being highly analytical, and the track record. That's mm -hmm. what's going to get us there. Mm -hmm. Agreed. If you're talking about 10 years, and you are, uh, <clears throat> the next two or three years will be the most important years of our life. If we don't screw it up, if we maintain a good track record, we will be um, you know, a giant among midgets because everybody's going to shrink, right? And so I believe that we're going to be able to slingshot our way into that. So it's a little bit like a pool shot where you've got to bounce off the board and hit the ball. But if you're looking 10 years out, you're looking for a bank because the bank's going to hit the eight ball, the eight ball's going to hit the other ball, put it in the pocket. What I mean by that is <clears throat> we um, are pretty good about understanding our industry and when to go and when not to go. Economy, yeah, maybe 55 to 45 or whatever. But if you put us in our hood, which is real estate, when should you buy it, when should you sell, it's clear. After 39 years, the numbers were small, but they were always good. And they just got larger on the same thesis. Anybody that can make returns in the 20s deserves to have a fund. So there's your answer. The next four years or three years until the fund, people are going to be watching us like a hawk. They ain't going to give a shit about what happened 15 years ago. They're not, because they're going to look at me and say, you an old dude, okay? That was then. Fine, put it on your tombstone. But we're investing in this group now and show me the numbers. And so what we do this year, what we do next year, how we handle ourselves will set us up for the great deep forward. Both ways. If we take the opportunity away from us, if we go from the top 10 percentile down to the middle, then we're screwed. So all eyes are not going to be on the movies we produced you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. That's yesterday's news. All eyes are going to be on this day over the next couple of years. So the people in this room are going to make that happen or not make it happen. So there's an answer, I think, is it will be the next couple of years. It deals with buy and how well we do with them. And I'm paying half attention, which is better than no attention, but it ain't enough. So you guys got to pay a lot more attention, and and I think if we can make that work the next couple of years, then we're going to own the future. That that will happen, and you saw it happen on Bob's graph. Uh, and we'll figure it out, but it's going to take smart, driven, hardworking people that want to make it happen. One of the things that, uh, as I was noting uh, on that curve, I saw some similarities. You put our curve up; it's smaller than Bob's, right? but it's got the same shape. 
if people are ambitious, they bite off more than they can chew. That's step one. If they're tough and smart, they figure it out and they make it work. They throw the things that didn't work, like Bob did with China. Um, they focus on the things that do and they scale. That's the process. So, you know, I think I think ten years out uh, will not will not be made by the tracker. We'll bring people to the table, but they will be mostly looking at what did you do for your partners in 23, 24, 25, and there'll be enough of a show. There won't be final results, but there'll be enough of a show that we can show them. Here's what we did in Canada. Here's what we did in you know this deal, that deal, anything else. And they'll look at it and say, "Man, because you guys got it." But we're going to use that information. So we're setting ourselves up. You know, in pool, you you, you don't just make the shot. You set yourself up with a net shot if you want to run the table. And so that's our job. You know, we cleaned a lot of the table. <laughs> There's a couple of hard shots left. And by the way, that's your name. Thanks, Marcel. All right, Elisa, you have another question? Um, so with for part of our CS, you invest in everything, which is fantastic because we get like just an amazing just variety of assets that we all get to deal with, whether it's accounting, finance, asset management. When we look at doing a fund in the future, do you see it that there'll be, if it's going to be one specific asset type, which typically you see with the fund structures, and how does RCS kind of change their their, their, their spend on that? You know, or is it you've got X is only fund and then the rest is else, you know, how do you draw that line? Well, we've thought about that a great deal, and that's a very good question, uh, because you have to rethink it and you have to decide. Uh, I have the time, the money, and the energy to place my money in the most you heard and place it. Okay. At that point in time, I'm with the fund. So if I've got 50 million, um, which would be a good guess, I want to put a lot of money up. If this fund's going to work, they're going to watch my feet. And if I say, talk all these hot shots, we just hired and all these smart guys that are running my company, and by the way, they're putting in two million, and you're putting in five hundred million. They're gonna. It ain't gonna feel quite right to them. But if I show up at the table and say my employees are putting in five million and I'm putting in forty-five million, I'm in. Then they'll pay attention because they go, ah, oh, the old man's in. Uh, his employees are in. And at that point in time, we're gonna have to carve things geographically or category wise. So there's a lot of things I won't be able to do. But today I can you know, go to Turkey and buy an office building if I want, right? But once we have the fund, you know, there's gonna be uh, you know, there's gonna be guardrails on us. You know, because I like making money, but I hate going to jail. So we crystal clear on what I can do and what I can't do. So A, I'm gonna replace my money now because I think it's a damn good time. I'm old enough, young enough to be able to do that, and then later on, I take the good part of my money and put it into the series of funds, um, and you know that's what it'll work. But I'm not going to be able to have it both ways. I'm going to take this office building for our son and family, and I'm going to get that office building to the fund. That needs to work. Yeah, to answer your question a little more um, specifically, Lisa, I think you're saying, have we chosen a category for the fund? We haven't yet. I, I think Adam would tell you we're considering multifamily or a multifamily in a certain geographic area as being one of the funds. Marcel does want to buy some multifamily, I believe, for the Safeco, so we'd have to split it up geographically. As he said, you can't, you can't just pick and choose what goes into the fund and what you put in your own <coughs> pockets. So we, we will we will have a category or two and or geographic area, um, and it'll be very clear. There's another comment because uh, Bob has hung around for six years helping us on the succession thing. There's a couple of um, kind of moves that you have to make that are sort of non-intuitive, but you have to make them. That is, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. How funds work? Like I can't compete. With you know, nobody can give me a dime and they shouldn't. So the fund documents are going to be very strict. By placing my money now, 
and then turning it over to Safeco, we've solved that problem. Because otherwise, I buy an apartment building, I make it worth more, then I sell the apartment building, now what do I do with the money? I go compete with my own fund. It ain't gonna happen. So one of the things that Safeco does is it unlocks that dilemma for me. I place my money, and so instead of making 25% on an apartment deal by owning it for five years buying close up high, I make 15% for 30 years by buying it, turning it over to the foundation and you know to Judy's team and the soul team, and you guys run that for 30 years. But I'm not allowed to sell it, I can sell it, but then I gotta go and buy another apartment. Well, wait a minute, I'm in conflict. Now there's a lot of other things you can do in life. You know, I can go to different countries. One day you're gonna want to go to Canada, probably the fund day you're gonna want to go to Mexico. So you can do that. You can also pick geographies so that, you know, you might do you know, 80% of America, pick it and say the fund does 80% of America and more subjects to play in the other 20%. But Safeco was a strategic decision uh, that came out of, you know, Bob's advice, other advisors, uh, uh, Patrice sitting down with Cindy and me. And as some of you know, you know, Cinda is not a business person. She wants to run the foundation, she's loyal, she's smart, uh, but she doesn't want to be CEO or even chairman. And so you have to take that into account, design a company that works for her. Well, Safeco works for her. You've got a lot of talented people, and if you're not, you know, if you're going to own something until it turns into dust, collect the checks. And so Safeco unlocked a lot of problems, um, you know, what do we do, and, and then the fund was able to show up as a safe code, and then all of a sudden the pattern worked. Thanks, Marcel. Anybody else? A oh, come on. Five dollar bills, maybe even ten for this next question. You never know. <laughs> oh, there. Misha. Do you know how many people you'll need to hire to get the funds up and running? We have not gotten that far yet. That that's going to be one of the first things that we do in this planning stage this next year. Um, Adam's, Adam's going to be creating a committee, I believe, and kind of really diving into the specifics of how we're going to implement this. We're going to need to hire, you know, certainly one or two senior people who are then going to probably, um, you know, we haven't even decided exactly, if, you know, how much of it. For instance, are, are we going to hire third-party accounting for the fund piece of it and just keep all the accounting on all the RCS and family office stuff? Or is there going to be a blend where we get an outside audit company to do it? Are we who's going to, are we going to have separate, you know, a, a firewall between asset management teams? Probably not, but we don't, have, you know, there's a lot that we have, and so it, it's going to be quite a bit. I mean, as you can see by that that growth curve on a dollar amount, and we're going to be buying bigger deals going forward, and it's you know, there's economies of scale there. But my my guess would be, I don't know, Adam, what do you think? I'm thinking we double in the next, you know, five to ten years. We're we're doubling in size. Would you agree, Adam? Yeah. Yeah. And I've uh, talked to uh, four people that uh, that actually buy uh, that I've had deep conversations with several of them on funds, what you should do, what you shouldn't. And all of them have come up with if you think you can just take an entrepreneurial shop, turn a switch and put a fund sign up, it doesn't work that way. You know, the capital raise is completely different. Mm -hmm. The leadership is different. Mm -hmm. Uh, the acquisitions are similar, the legal is similar, the, but, but, you know, the legal. So there are three or four key people, apparently, uh, that I've been advised uh, by the people who run you know, the funds, the two people I talked to are both in number five. And so they have a fair amount of experience. And by the way, every one of them said, damn, if I can do it, your team can do it. Because that was part of my question. Hey, I'm 75. What's it going to look like? And he said, "Don't worry about it." And one of them uh, is in those for big investment. Their fund. <clears throat> the way he put it is, I got a lot of investors that would love to invest. In me. So if you decide to do a fund, I want you to come up here and I'll introduce you to a bunch of people, including the boss. Um, but he said, "You're you're going to be able to do a 400." The other guy said 200, 250. So we're getting different types of advice. 
but every one of them say you, you can't just take your current staff, plug it into a fund, you're going to have to bring in ringers. And, you know, these would be pretty senior people. And, and it's going to cost a lot of money on the startup. You're going to have to write checks uh, because it takes about a year or two to bring senior people on, pay them, and they ain't cheap, pay them to set everything up and to get it ready to go. And so it'll be a couple, probably, you know, depending on what top you want to do, you know, startup costs. And uh, so you've got to be ready for that too. But, uh, but we're going to try to get five people, you know, people that, that really can ensure that our goals are met and that we don't, you know, well, I said chief people, not chief people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, we have time for just a couple more minutes. So time for one more question. Owen. What is Lamar's outlook for shopping centers buying and selling this year? We we have an aggressive goal this year of about eighty million, and I don't know that we're going to meet it. You know, it, I'll be honest. It, it's going to be a, it's it's tough out there still. They do have just like Adam's sort of exponential increase. We we, we do think there's going to be some blood in the water on on, on the retail side as well in the coming years. Um, there's just no two ways about it. I mean, people have refinanced loans, et cetera, and when those loans come due and they have to roll into higher interest rates, there's going to be a number of, uh, of sellers that just don't want to do it, or there's going to be funds and things that just, you know, we, we've bought a number of those over the last few years where, you know, they just need to get out of that last deal, the last two deals, whatever it is. We, we do believe there's, it, it's going to, it kind of, the amount we buy in retail is going to exponentially increase them over the next few years, and we, we think just like in, in the office and, and, and multifamily and other sectors, there, there's going to be some great opportunities in 24 to 26 and, and beyond, potentially. And Rudy? I want to jump in because my question would branch, branches off of what he was saying, <clears throat> excuse me, asking, it, you know, prior to COVID, as retail deals started to come through, there was a lot of belief that retail was dying, right? Everything's going online. And then COVID hit, and of course, the whole world shut down. And then we come out of it, and the one asset class you had on your chart is what we should buy right now, or at least the highest rated, was retail. Does at some point, you know, the, the world get back to what's going on with, with retail and everything is online and... So, so one thing really is that it, it, it's, first of all, it's not online versus in bricks and mortar. What, what retailers have found over the last five years and during COVID in particular is that you actually need both presence and that's the focus model. You, you do need that online retailers do better if there's a, a bricks and mortar retail location there. But it's also not just about buying things, it's about the experience. And the shopping centers that do the best have a lot of those experiential. They have the, re the restaurants and the yoga studios, the Pilates studios, and the, the gyms and the, 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 the kids play gyms and the, and the you know, whatevers. But it's, it's not just about buying stuff. A lot of those, you know, kind of, you know, old school from 20 years ago, just, you know, all those clothing stores after clothing store after clothing store. You're not going to see retail centers like that. Those lifestyles that, you know, lifestyle style centers like that are a thing of the past. They've all sort of they've turned a corner and, and, and Rev2 on lifestyle centers has a lot more of that experiential. And that's what we realized during COVID isn't going away. People are sick and tired of eating takeout in their in their living room, they they really they like to go out and experience stuff. They they want to do yoga in person. They don't want to they don't want to do it in front of their you know Zoom video, um, etc. So I, I I think and on top of what, what to piggyback off what Adam mentioned, there's been very little retail construction over the last decade, and so that's helped quite a bit, obviously, and and that's. And because it wasn't such the darling, and because, you know, obviously during COVID, it was a four-letter word like offices now, you know, cap rates sort of spiked up. So when they, they sort of stayed high, even, even post, I don't know if you ever post COVID, but let's say, you know, in 2021, 2022. So as interest rates rose, that was one of the few sectors where you could still make sense of a deal because you're buying at a nine cap, and you, can, you know, or an eight and a half cap, as opposed to a four cap on multifamily or three and a half or, you know, whatever on multifamily or industrial. Those don't make sense anymore when you got six and a half percent mortgage rates. So um, I, I do think there's a, there's quite a bit of a runway still for for retail. Cinda, I'll take the five dollars. Okay. <laughs> 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 when does the bar open? <laughs> 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 
Right in there, so great question. Oh, what? Oh, yes, one last thing. There was a nice session. We have books in the office. A lot of you already have these books. I know most new employees are given this book You know when they start. Um, some of you are, have been around for a while may have lost it and they want another copy. I'm not sure that everyone got this newer version, which is Jim Collins' Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. But we have copies. Anyone who wants a copy, we have plenty of copies back in the office. Just let Emily know and she'll put a copy on your desk in your paper office. That's all I have to say, and the bar is open. <laughs>